I got money on my mind. I'm just trying to get some dough. I ain't picking up my line unless it's money on the phone. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Black Wealth Renaissance Podcast. Your boy, David Bella, one fourth of the Black Wealth Renaissance, checking in with my co host, fellas. How y'all feeling? What up, what up, what up? It's your boy, Jalen, man. Another quarter of the Black Wealth Renaissance. Feeling good, feeling great, man. Got got a little bit of this winter weather going oh, man, on. It's crazy. This actually. Saturday, man. We in the twi- we in the twenties in Texas, bro. So <laughs> it's 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 crazy. It's your boy Jared, another fourth of Black Wolf Renaissance checking in. Man, yeah, I, I, this this weather is ridiculous. They they talking about a hundred percent chance of snow in Louisiana on Monday. I nah, I'm not with this. <laughs> it's not why we live in the South at all. <laughs> at all. We're trying to avoid all that craziness, but. Yeah, y'all, once again, uh, we got a great episode planned for y'all today. Um, before I introduce our guest, I'd like to ask everybody to like, subscribe, rate, comment on whatever platform you're on. Uh, it helps us grow the show. And yeah, y'all just let us know. Let us know what y'all trying to hear. We always here to serve our community. Now, for today's guest, we got a great brother on out of Tampa, Florida. Um, he is a software engineer and technology developer and the CTO of Hire Match. Uh, a technology that is revolutionizing the hiring process with the blockchain. We have Mr. Armando Pantoja, a.k.a. Tall Guy Tycoon. Armando, how you living, my brother? I'm fine. How are you guys doing? Hey, man. Thank you for coming on the show, my brother. Appreciate it. I appreciate you guys having me, man. Thanks for the time. Most deaf, most deaf, man. I'm glad you could get on here to definitely kick game to the people. So, Armando, man, the way we always kick these things off, we always want to ask you, like, what was your start? Like, how did you find your way into like the software technology space? Uh, I mean, ever since I was a kid, I've always been interested in uh, software and technology. But like I said, you know, uh, like I say a lot of times on my, you know, my page or whatever, is that I came from poverty, so we couldn't afford a computer, right? So I, I would always read books about it, but I, we never, I didn't have a computer until I was what twenty two. I bought it myself when I was in college. So there was this book. I think it was like Boy's Life, right? Mm-hmm. I forget the name of the book. Maybe it was highlights or something. I forget. But we used to get it when I was like in the seventh, eighth grade. It was like a little magazine. And in the magazine, they had like code sections. Like it taught you how to code, right? Now, and, and I, like you could, you could actually, it would teach you how to code without actually having a computer. Hmm. And that's how I first got into it is that uh, it was some book that had like code segments. It was basic. Uh, that's the software language that it was in. And it would like first step, do this, second step, do this, third step, do this or whatever. And that was the first time I ever got exposed to anything like that. And then ever since then, I was like, you know, just addicted to technology, I guess. Uh, even though I didn't have a computer, so I would stay late at school or before basketball practice or whatever, go to the library on breaks or whatever, you know, get uh, that computer time in. And I just, you know, I just, just kept uh, learning and, and going forward from there. That's interesting. I, I've never even uh, heard like, I just learned how to code without the computer. So yeah. like, was it just telling you, you know, like this is what this line means? Yeah. Like it was just teaching you the basic language. Yeah, it would teach you like the if statements, uh, and and like the different loops and stuff. It would just, I mean, uh, you can do that. You know, you could actually draw that out and do it yourself. And would act, it actually gives you a better understanding of code if you learn like that. Mm-hmm. You so because you know it like down to the real level. So by the time you get to it on the computer, you already got it. You know. Can, can you kind of explain it a little bit more? Because I'm not going to lie. I'm not the okay. most coding literate person, but I am interested in it because right. I know the importance of it. Yeah, so co- all coding is is just steps to do something, right? Mm-hmm. Like do this first, do this second, do this third. And, and if this happens, do this. Or if that happens, do that. That's the that's all it is. Bro. That's the it's if statements and, and, and loops, mm-hmm. right? So you, you, you can kind of figure out what the if statements, right? So let's say, for example, uh, you wanted, you wanted, uh, you had a butler, right? And you wanted him to go to the store. So people, we, we get, we write instructions all the time. That's called an algorithm. That's what an algorithm is a set of instructions to do something. We always, we always hear about the uh, Instagram algorithm. Mm-hmm. Now, that's all it is. Algorithms all around us. Every software application has an algorithm set running. An algorithm can be inside computer science and it can be outside. All algorithm means is a step of instructions to do something, right? Mm-hmm. That's it. So, uh, let's say, for example, you have a butler, right? And you want him to go to the store. You read him a list. You say, I want you to first wake up in the morning. That's step one. Go to the store, step two. Step three is to check if there are apples, right? And if there are apples, buy some. If there are not apples, go to another store and continue to do this until you find apples, right? So you, what you've just done is you've given him a set of instructions that he must continue to follow until those apples are found. And then the instructions are over. That's all a computer program is. 
it's good. instead of telling the butler, you tell the pro the computer to do it. I want you to do this first, do this second, do this third. And if this happens, do that. If that happens, do that. And continue to do this thing until one of those conditions are met. And then you can quit. Mm -hmm. Same thing. But you can write that on a piece of paper. Hey, man. And I, I've never had it broken down like that. But that sounds very, very simple. So I guess the complexity comes in whenever you get to learning these different languages. Is that yeah. where, like, it, it gets a little bit more? I mean, it's everything you write in computer science is just if state ba the base of it is those if statements, if this happens, do that, and those loops. But it can get complicated, you know, because loops can build on the loops, and then if statements get complicated, then you can the way that the uh, the numbers and the data comes in can it gets complicated. But that's all it really is. So fast forward, you get you're yeah, twenty two. You, you mentioned yeah, you got your first computer at twenty two in college. What was your uh, your major and stuff in school? My major was computer science. Uh, and, and when I was in high school, I forgot to leave out a step. I did get a, a TI-85 calculator, those Texas Instruments. Mm -hmm. And those had a programming uh, feature on there. And I, I, that's, I got some more programming in doing that. You know, just uh, programming on that TI-85 calculator. Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like a C-based language. Yeah, I got a lot in, in high school doing that. So some of those calculators are pretty advanced. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like the graphing calculators, right? Yeah, yeah, the graphing calculators, yeah. Man, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, like, I'd be in math class. I wouldn't be paying attention getting F's in math or D's because I did graduate, but I'd be programming, <laughs> you know, I failed a test, but I'd get a, I, I'd be programming while, you know, the math teachers are in front, you know, but, uh, but that's how I got into it. Really. The craziest thing I've ever done on that, that calculator. I found out you could play the game snake. So I, yeah, I found yeah. out you could play the game snake. I never paid attention to math class again. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people figure that stuff out, but somebody programs those games in there, so. That's crazy. So whenever you got to school and, you know, you really figured out, I really love this computer programming and stuff, when, what, what what time frame did you go to school? What, what year did you get to college? I went in 2000, uh, I graduated in 2005. Okay, so we, we're younger. Uh, I graduated in 2017. Mm -hmm. So okay, that's, yeah. that's, that's like right after the dot-com bubble, yeah. um, but still pre-social media really, really taking off. Yeah, what, social media started like taking off at the end, like 2005. So I remember it was my last year. So what was the landscape like whenever you were learning about computer programming in that year? What were they projecting it to kind of do some of the things that they were uh, foreseeing in the future? Is it coming to fruition right now or did it kind yeah. of deviate? I mean, AI, the AI stuff, they, they kind of predicted that. But the, the, the cryptocurrency, it was uh, like came out of left field. Nobody, nobody really predicted that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and the funny thing about the cryptocurrency is it came out while I was in college studying cryptology. You know, I was in grad school, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was in grad school in 2010, 11. And that's when uh, Bitcoin came out in 2009. And I was studying exactly what, what Bitcoin was. You know, Bitcoin is based on cryptology, but nobody saw Bitcoin come out everybody nobody knew about you know new blockchain was coming that just came out of nowhere but uh but ai and all the stuff we're doing now even the social media and the internet of things that was all predicted even when i was in college so so i i, I kind of want to jump into both of them so first i'll go with like the 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 ai and all of those type of things so whenever you were graduating did you go to work for like a tech firm or something like that yeah I actually worked for a company called EdgeNet in Nashville, and it was a uh, it was a uh, artificial intelligence company, artificial intelligence company. Uh, I'm sorry, expert system company. I should say it's kind of the same thing. Uh, and I worked for them for about a year or two, uh, about a year and a half before I ended up getting laid off because that it was a it was an expert system company, but it was linked to the uh, to the home. It, it, we we did uh, software for to configure windows and doors in new houses. Mm -hmm. so that was in 2007. Now, right after that, you know. 2008, the housing yeah. crisis, whatever, and that, you know, and that was, that was it. So um, that was the first company I worked at. Mm. So, and you, what, can you explain the AI part? Because a lot of people, they'll hear artificial intelligence and we'll get a lot of negative connotations to it. We you saw know, the movie, we saw, yeah, we saw the movie, uh, iRobot and yeah. all of the, the Terminator, all of these other crazy things. But there is some valid use cases for artificial intelligence. I mean, the thing about it is artificial intelligence is already all, all around us. You just don't realize mm -hmm. it. It's, ha it's all around us. And, you know, and we can go back into the 60s, right? In the 60s, the computer scientists said, uh, they, you know, it was always arguments over uh, when, when, when would you admit that a computer has true intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the benchmarks back then was that if a computer can beat a man in chess, 
chess, I would say it's, uh, it's, it's intelligent, right? That happened 20 some years ago. So what happens with artificial intelligence is that and when we meet those, what, like we go back 10 years ago, what, when we say what we thought was intelligence, when the computers meet that, that, that benchmark, we, we move the goalposts farther mm. and farther down because it's hard for humans to accept that a computer actually has intelligence. So when an artificial intelligence really comes, the scary part is not going to be like the movie I, Robot. It's not going to be like the Terminator. It's just going to be in the back end and we won't even realize it. That's, that's the scary part. And it's, it could already be here. You know, we could, a lot of the things, our decisions we make in life are already governed by artificial intelligence. We don't realize it. You know, mm -hmm. credit, credit decisions, uh, you know, bank, uh, when, you, when you scan a card, let's say, for example, you're in a foreign company and it gets rejected, that's an AI that runs that algorithm to say, well, this, this type of person doesn't, wouldn't travel, so this is probably a fraudulent uh, transaction. Mm -hmm. All of that stuff is AI, right? When you're in a car, right, and, and uh, now they have it where, so, before you hit somebody like a pedestrian or something, the car stops, that's mm. all AI. It's all around us. You just don't realize it, right? And that's the scary part. Yeah, man. Like you said, that back end stuff, I guess that's the part that really scares people is because we hear the, like, um, I think it was like last year, Facebook or Google had to shut down a project because it, like, it, it had developed its own language or whatnot and the computers were talking. People hear stuff like that. And I guess we instantly jump to the sci-fi stuff yeah. versus thinking of the it's actual be real like life that. use. If they take over, let's say, you know, like Bill Gates has concerns too that our AI may just take over one day. I can see that point. But, uh, but it, the way, it, if it does happen, it's going to happen. In the, we won't, it won't be like a robot walking up, you know, and, and, and telling you to get on the ground. It's not going to be, it's going to be subtle. And that's what that's the scary part is that it's going to just be subtle, right? And we're going to accept it because, like, and I can I can give a good example of how we accept technology and in, intruding in our lives. If you go back to the '90s and you said, "Hey, I'm gonna put a device in your house that listens to everything you say, everything you say," and I'm gonna, in uh, in return for that, I'll give you a service that where you can ask questions. People would have said, "No way, man! I'm not doing that. You're crazy." Now everybody has a Google or Alexa in their house, listening to mm -hmm. everything they say. It's always on. So everything you say gets pushed through that artificial intelligence, everything, right? So <clears throat> when artificial intelligence gets there, what's going to happen is that people will allow, will give up power to it because for the convenience, like we do with everything else in technology. We, hmm. we, act, we give up power to technology for convenience. That's why we let Google, the Google phones track our every movement. Apple, the apples can tr track everything you do. We, uh, we let uh, these, uh, like Gmail, it reads all your emails, everything that comes to all your text gets read. You know, we got devices in our house listed to everything you say. And these are creating models of what you are and what you're trying to predict your future behavior. And we, we let it happen, right? Because of the convenience. Mm. And, and I think that, like you said, it'll be subtle. Even I'm thinking about like these cars that they're trying to push out now, like a Tesla. A lot, mm -hmm. of, a lot of Tesla is artificial intelligence with like the self-driving. Um, it is. I don't whenever they go, because I know all of that goes through the data processes and exactly. they'll, they'll match it to like, other driver's patterns. So like, like you would say, it, it would be subtle, but I could see like, if they were to take over, like, what if you just ride in your car, your shit just take yeah. a, a left instead of a right. Like, hey, we're gonna put all the humans over here right now. Yeah, they could. It's gonna, it's, yeah, it's gonna I think it's a good chance eventually that's gonna happen unless we protect against it. Mm. I mean, it just, I mean, it, it's gonna happen eventually. Like I said, Bill Gates said it, Stephen Hawking said it before he died. I mean. Some of the smartest people in the world say that this is a possibility or a big chance this could happen. So how, how yeah. do you, how do you think we protect ourselves from that? Do you do you? I don't think we can because people are always pushing for innovation and new things, right? So I mean mm -hmm. that that's how, that's what that's one of the perils of like capitalism, is that it will you would almost cause it to we we'll destroy ourselves because of the money behind it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that people will never stop pushing technology till it's too late? You know that's that's what's probably you know it's probably no way to stop it really. That's, because of the, the monetary benefit of keep continuing to push forward. That's that's the craziest thing you said that it made me think back to like your story once again. You said like in 07, 08, whenever all that stuff went left. I kind of want to get back into that, like because capitalism, that was the whole part of it. Like the banks were doing all this crazy stuff and it led the economy to go belly up. So like what what was your move after um after like everything kind of went crazy, like was this space still lucrative for people or was it like, like what, what was that like? Uh, back then, okay, so this is what I did and I always encourage other people to do it. So I took advantage 
because 2007, 2008, Obama got in and he extended the unemployment, right? So I actually took advantage of that. Un I was on unemployment at that time for 18 months, the max allowable. And I used that time to build more skills and I learned more and I started a my first company during that time. Mm -hmm. I used that unemployment to do that. So a lot of times you get like, you know, some bad apps you, you use that, you know, you can use that as, as a, and that's actually where I'm at today is because of I got laid off. You know, so I use that time to learn other languages that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I use that time to understand more about the software business. I put out a, a couple of applications uh, that I sold and did pretty well on uh, during that time. So, I mean, uh, that's how I got out of it. And that's what I, I use that time in my benefit. And like I said, and everything I've done since then is, was springboarded from that. So what, what, what did it look like you creating your first company during that time? So it was a, it was a small, it was just me, a one man shop. I created this application called Key Prowler. And what this was, was uh, it, remember remember at this time, social media was just coming out. Mm -hmm. It's just getting big, right? So 2005, 2006, 2007. So a lot of parents, like they are with any new technology, they're panicking. So last I thought, week, you know, kids week. are getting like, like approached by pedophiles and all this stuff. So I had this application where you can, uh, you would put it on your computer. Because remember, it wasn't all the phone social media back then. It was mostly mm -hmm. on the computer. Yep. So you can install it and it would monitor your kids for certain keywords you know, like, you know, sex or, or we marijuana, we whatever, and whatever you wanted to mind. And when your kid uh, got into the wrong neighborhood, you know, quote unquote neighborhood, like bad pages, or they start saying things that were leading them down a bad path, you'd get an alert on your, uh, on your email or a screenshot of whatever they were saying. So it was meant to, uh, to monitor kids that were under 13. Uh, and it was like one of the, it was, it, it was, it was other competitors out there at the mm -hmm. time, but mine was simple to use. A lot of those were too difficult. So I did pretty good with that. I ended up selling the company uh, about two or three years later. So how did it look like getting that out there in a, a pre, I guess, social media uh, type of era? Like, how did that look as far as the advertising? Yeah, it, it was, yeah, it was it getting was, it really out there and getting the parents on it. I'm glad you said that, man, because a lot of people don't understand how powerful social media is now when it mm -hmm. comes to advertising your product, when it comes to advertising your service. Man, back then it was hard. Like, you, you would have to pay Google ads, and that's expensive. You know, or you would have to, it was hard to get your things out there, man. You just had to compete with the big boys. You didn't have like your, your small communities that you have in social media now, which, which I tell people a lot of time, this is a great time right now. And I know you guys talk about that a lot is that you got to use social media. It's, the, it's, it's almost dirt cheap advertising compared to what I'm used to. You know, like I would sell that application for $40. I had to pay $25 to get, the, you know, with, with the clicks and clicks mm -hmm. to get somebody to buy it, you know? So uh, I said on my profit only 10 or $11 on each uh, application. But, uh, but now, I mean, you can get it for almost pennies on the dollar, almost nothing. You know, if you know how to, if, like you guys talk about all the time, if you know how to market yourself, you know how to position yourself on social media, you know, you can get it for 10, you know, 100 times cheaper than what it was back then to get your product out. So were, can, were there some benefits to starting a company back then that's probably not here today and vice versa? I would say that the benefit back then was there was not many competitors. Mm -hmm. Now there's a lot more competitors because of social media, but uh, it also gives you a platform that's, that's very cheap in advertising. I mean, you can almost pay no advertising dollars and still do well. And, uh, yeah, if, if, if you do it right, if you if you just look right. up and go uh, viral or something like that. Yeah. Like you said, niche-based marketing, that's really yeah. the, the hugest thing. Like you can get in front of specific niches of that. Yeah. Like people already build audiences that would be interested in your stuff that you pay a a much cheaper fee than you would for Google, like versus $25 per sale, you might pay $200 and make three, four, five, six sales. I don't, yeah. I don't know exactly what the price was exactly. You said 40, maybe even 10 sales, it just depends. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot cheaper. Like back then you had to, you, you had to be good at Google ads and uh, just it was, as social, uh, SEO. So I, you had to get, you know, SEO was big, but it still is big, but it was a lot mm -hmm. bigger back then. And you just had to, uh, you know, uh, so you optimize your page correctly so it would show up in the search engines, and you had to, uh, you know, just master Google, uh, Google AdWords, and mm -hmm. all the other. You know, that's the only way really back then. If you're small, you couldn't really get the attention, uh, you know, anywhere else. So we still in 2007, like around that time. When did you become start to get your interest in finance and like financial literacy? Also, like, was that around that time, or was it a little bit after? When did you start dabbling into that section? All right. When I got out of college, I was I started trading stocks. Right, like right around that time, I had that first job. I had some extra money. You know, it's first time I ever made any decent money, so I had a little extra to spare. So I started getting in stocks, man. So I, the first stock I did was uh was in two thousand seven or into two thousand seven, early two thousand eight, when the market was crashing. 
I bought a stock when it fell all the way down to the bottom. Fannie Mae was my first stock ever. Fannie oh, Mae. Wow. Yeah. So I think it was in 2008. I think it was in 2008. Uh, so during that summer, uh, now actually I bought another stock before that, but it was like small, like $30 worth. But Fannie Mae was my b first b big uh, actual stock purchase that I made, you know, that, that, I, that I really was into it, right? So the first was like $100 or something. But this one, I put 5,000 into it because Fannie Mae fell down after it, during that in the summer yeah. of that 2008 crashes, it went from like 30 to three dollars, and then it went under to like a 80 cents. And when it went under, I put five thousand into it, and it came up to three dollars. Hmm. That was the first one I ever did. I made like I turned five into twenty thousand. I ended up losing it all right after that. But you know, I, you know, you get overconfident. And you're like, oh, man, I can do this all the time, man. And then you used to put it back in. I end up losing most of it, you know, in different trades. But. Hmm. Um, and it was a good learning experience and it taught me the power of uh, that finance. And I started, after that, I started learning about why, how did I go wrong? What should I have done different? And I, and I kept coming, even though I lost most of it, I probably ended up losing all of it over the next two years, but I kept pushing myself to learn mm -hmm. more and I, I was willing to risk more and more money. And about three or four years into it, I got real good at it. And around that time, this was about 2010, 2011. Uh, so I started you know, teaching myself, learning more about it along with the computer science or whatever. And uh, so 2000, you know, into the mid 2000, you know, 2015 or so, there was, a, I wrote an application uh, called I Stock Picker. Uh, mm -hmm. And that one, uh, and that one actually won an honorable mention at Benzinga. And that's a pretty big financial firm up in New York. Uh, so that, 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 that's when I really learned about stocks and how it all works. Cause I had to write the algorithms to, to pick stocks, right? To pick the best stocks. So I learned a lot about it. I learned more, like I knew how to trade stocks up into that point, but I learned about all the technical analysis and all the stuff that comes behind it doing that application. And then, uh, and then crypto, you know, crypto is a lot of the same type of uh, things. And I was, get, I got into that a few years earlier. So all of this stuff just started coming together. So Armando, can we get into technical analysis a little bit? Cause we speak on, uh, we, we speak around stocks a lot. And we speak a lot more on uh, fundamentals. Can you get into like some of the, I guess, the key tenets of what like technical analysis is? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think you're referring to chart reading or you're referring yeah. to just the metrics on the stop. Yeah, chart reading. I mean, uh, I, like like when, in my people, my people, I kind of I teach them about chart reading, but a lot of things you can do without reading charts at all. So in my, you know, chart reading is good and you can like uh, like RSI is a good one. Uh, Relative strain index. It'll teach you. It'll, it'll let you know if a stock's oversold or overbought. Uh, but. Uh, just constantly watching the chart really is for more like, you know, day traders that are high frequency traders. You know, and a lot, to, lot to, I don't, I don't really teach that that much, but I, I do have a chart reading class that I teach once a month, but uh, mostly we teach, uh, you know, just long-term investing uh, and option trade momentum strategies, but, uh, but this chart reading is important. Fundamentals are important. So around that time, you also talked about the crypto and like how you are getting into the cryptology and stuff like that. What made you go into that field? Like, cause it kind of seemed like you was a little bit ahead of the wave right before yeah, <laughs> and, uh, came in and came out with Bitcoin. So like, what made you link, link the cryptography to the, so to the technology? So, like I said, I was in grad school in 2010, 11 and 12. So I was in grad school at the time I was studying software security. Now crypto, that's why it's called cryptocurrency because it's based in cryptology. So it's, a, it's encrypted uh, currency. That's basically what it is. So I was studying encryption and cryptology at the time. So I was fascinated by it. I was like, oh man, what is this? But back then, yeah, I remember it was trading at, you know, about the first time I ever looked at Bitcoin, I think it was like $50, $60, eight, maybe 80 somewhere in there. And uh, and I was like, you know, what is this, man? Like, you know, I look at it, but you got to remember back then, it wasn't the same mindset that we have now. People just were buying and spending it. It was just a currency, right? So you bought it and you spent it on stuff. And that's what I did that. I probably went through thousand bitcoins back then like everybody else uh and then like i said it was the, the technology was fascinating to me and i liked it so uh i would i would search for businesses that took bitcoin back then it was a few of them in tampa and i would you know just go support them or whatever we have get meetups or whatever and talk about this stuff and um and so what happened around in 2013 there was this big hack called mt uh, mt gox where uh, an exchange got hacked for like, you know, $50 million back then. It was real early. It was like Bitcoin was only out three and a half years. And I, everybody thought Bitcoin was done, right? So it was still in the back of my mind, but like I kind of, everybody kind of like got off of it for a couple of years, mm -hmm. right? Then 2015 came and then Ethereum, and I started watching it again. You know, I was like, man, I think this is going to stay around, <laughs> you know? 
And uh, so 2014, 15 came and Ethereum came out, which is the second biggest crypto right now. And that really fascinated me because I, I thought Bitcoin was just by itself. Because back then it was like Bitcoin, Doggy Coin, I think was out then. It was a few, it was like five coins total. And Ethereum came out, which was fundamentally different than every coin that was out there. So when I saw that, I realized that all of this has potential. And then I started around 15, 16, I started seeing it as an investment. You know, then I started investing in it and, and building myself up and, and learning more about it uh, during that time. With the Ethereum, why did you say it was fundamentally different than the other coins? Because at the time you had like five coins, uh, Bitcoin, you had Litecoin, Doggy, I, don't, I think Doggy coin was out because, you know, that was a joke, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I guess it's okay now. But, uh, but you had Bitcoin out, but, but everything that was out there now was, was basically and fundamentally just copies of Bitcoin that was sped up or whatever, or, or you know, different, like Litecoin's quicker and, and more efficient, Dolly coin, you know, it was just different versions of Bitcoin, all based on blockchain technology, all the same thing, you know. Ethereum actually allowed people to develop apps on top of it and create their own coins on top of Ethereum. Hmm. So back then it was very difficult to create a coin. When Ethereum came out, it allowed you to create a coin called an ERC-20 token, using their, their whole network. So you can make a coin right now in like 10 minutes if you wanted to and, and get a coin out there, right? So that's, and, and plus they allow what's called smart contracts. And that it gives you the ability, let's say for example, me and you are gonna do a deal, right? Right now, let's say I was gonna, on, let's say on, on January 15th, I owe you, so I'm gonna pay you, let's say I, you wanna set up a trust for your kids. And you say, look, when they turn 30, I wanna give them both $100,000. Right now you have to go to a lawyer you have to pay the lawyer, the lawyer had to set up all these documents, whatever. But in Ethereum, it allows you to do what's called smart contracts in which you can write a contract on the network that says, look, on this date or whatever the criteria may be, I want this money released to these people based on this, 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 and that. So it's a contract that requires no lawyers, no third party. And when I saw those two features that you could write your applications on top of it and the smart contract, I realized, man, this is going to be, that's going to be, all this is going to be huge. And that's why I, it really like piqued my interest at that time. I kind of want to go back with it because I mean, you you said that it's like like for people that may not be understanding with uh, just I guess how these smart contracts technically work, like how how are they able to remove the lawyers and all these things from this process? Okay, um, so you got you got what's called the block. The blockchain is the network in which uh, most cryptocurrencies work on. It's just the the blockchain really is just. Uh, a network of computers or people, mm -hmm. you know, people that, that basically uh, allow their computers uh, to connect to the network. And they, each one of those computers stores the entire uh, transaction history of that particular crypto. So what that does, it gives redundancy, right? So if one of those computers fell, somebody else has it or somebody else had, you know, everybody all across the world has the entire copy, uh, an entire database mm -hmm. of each transaction. So smart contracts work in the same way. So that's how Bitcoin works, right? So Ethereum says, hey, let's, why don't we make, create a, a, some code, right? Just like we talked about earlier, that code, mm -hmm. you know, if, if statements or whatever. And we're going to say, we're going to put that same code on the blockchain that executes on a certain date or executes on a certain criteria. And that code is going to lock the coins up or whatever until this criteria hits and it gets stored on the blockchain, right? Mm -hmm. So there's nobody, the, the blockchain is, it cannot be, uh, tampered with it, it's perfect it cannot it, there's nobody that can hack it so it's a it's actually a safer way to store a contract than using a lawyer do you think they might we could see the stock market on the on the blockchain one day uh they said that uh, there was a company i don't know if it's doing it's called polymath that was going to do that but i don't know what happened with that but there was a couple of uh startups that that, that said they were going to do that but i don't think really? anyone yeah, the SEC is one a lot like they jump in and block that though. <laughs> yeah, they, of course. they're not trying to get cut out of the no, no, be in the middle, man. They want to control them switches. Yeah, I think that's what it is. What you got? They it, it was the hack earlier that you had mentioned. I wanted to go into that too. Um, I you, you made you mentioned the name of it, the uh MT Gox. MT Gox, yeah. So like you said it was a hack, um, but the blockchain, the blockchain can't be hacked. What type of hack was that? Yeah, so the blockchain can't be hacked, but your wallet can be hacked. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Because uh, you know, because the passwords or the, or the private keys on a wallet are stored in a database. So if you get into that database, you got everybody's password to get into their wallet. You know, so that's what happened, right? But what it did is it knocked confidence down a Bitcoin. So people were like, oh my, at that point people, you know, cause people, the way it was like, I guess marketed, but there's no marketing team, but the way people saw it is that the blockchain couldn't be hacked. But then when that happened, People didn't understand the difference. They just know that they got hacked. So it caused Bitcoin to go from a thousand all the way down to like 150. And it stayed there for a few years. 
everybody lost their confidence. So that's crazy. Yeah, people lost their confidence on something like that. So it was over. And it, it stayed like that for years until around 15, 16. Now about 16, 17, really. See, my first time really, like, I heard about it whenever I was in school, but I whenever it got really, like really, really, really got big was the movie Dope. That's whenever I paid attention. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Good yeah, movie. I was like, oh, damn, they pushing through Bitcoins. But yeah, I still did I saw that movie the other day and the price was only $300 when he was talking about it. That's crazy. <laughs> that movie, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy to see where it's at. You never watched Dope I never before? never watched that movie. It's a good movie, yeah. Yeah, you got to check it out, my brother. So I, I kind of want to move forward to like your company now that you're working on with the Iron blockchain Man. technology. So, you know, you took what you was learning from your cryptography and your technology skills and you created this company called Higher Match. Can you yes. tell us a little bit about Higher Match? Yeah, so Higher Match is going to address the difficulty right now in, uh, in the human resources market, the, uh, the recruiting market. So right now, uh, if you want to, if uh, I don't know, a lot of people may or may not know this, but uh, when, let's say, uh, and I know this from my own experience, right, is getting, you know, recruiters coming after me for software engineering jobs. And when they place somebody, let's say you make $100,000, the recruiter gets 20000 of that just for placing you. Yeah. For uh, for six figure uh, six figure careers, if you if the recruiter can place a six figure career, they get like twenty thirty thousand for that, you know. Right. After the person completes their like six months or whatever, so I realized that that's that's it's probably it's a lot of money, man. Like that must, whenever there's a high margin like that, there's, there's always an inefficiency in the marketplace because why would you know you can do this a lot more efficiently, you know? Uh, and a lot of companies you would you you would think that companies would go to let's say like just put a, a, a application put a job on Monster or, or Indeed, yeah. but they don't do that because it's because they get better quality candidates when they use recruiters because recruiters actually do the filtering they test you and do us by the time you get to the company all they got to do is a quick interview and they know you're good hmm. right so the company's like you know we don't want to waste all this time or whatever we'll just pay somebody to twenty thousand hire somebody especially a lot of older companies with money they don't care they just get recruiters. And, uh, and, and, and I realized, you know, well, uh, you know, why can't we use crypt, the blockchain to do this work for us instead of having paying recruiters 20,000? Why don't we just crowdsource it, basically? You mm -hmm. know, say, look, you know, put this money out into the network and say, whoever, I don't care if you're a recruiter or not, whoever brings me the best candidate is going to get this money. Right. Mm -hmm. So you put the money out in cryptocurrency. You say, look, man, there's a bounty out there. So whoever brings me the candidate gets half the money. Whoever brings me people that are, are even interviewed gets a certain amount of money. People that everybody that contributes gets a certain amount of money. So everybody that helped or aided in bringing that candidate to, to the job will get a get a, a part of that, uh, that fee that they put out. So instead of putting 20000 to a recruiter, you may only have to put 5000 into the system. And that inspires or you know incentivizes all these people to work for you to find the best candidate. Like you may have a friend or, you know, maybe a, a real recruiter is on there and they found some candidates to throw them in and it goes to a system and whoever actually gets hired, uh, the person who uh, sent that hire in uh, gets a large, a larger fee and then it goes down from there. Mm -hmm. So are you, are you going to be doing this off of the smart contracts or and is it going to be like meshed with the blockchain? Yeah, it's both of those. So when somebody puts the money out there, it gets locked into a smart contract. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that ensures that the parties are going to get paid so they can go out there and look online, you know, because the blockchain is, uh, is is transparent. So we can anybody can look online and see what's out there. Uh, so we, you can look online and say, hey, I know that money's out there so I can start doing my work. So when you do send that candidate in there, the, the smart contract triggers and then it releases that money to you once that person gets hired. So oh, yeah. we all got questions. <laughs> I'm going to let Jared go. No, no, no. I was just saying that was dope. I didn't even have a question. That's just a really cool concept, but y'all can go. Okay, so like I, I with the people with the smart contracts um that are gonna be sending them in sending people in. So do both parties have to sign the smart contract? Like does the recruiter and the person they recruited have to sign for this to like like yeah, how does that show through? You don't have to you don't have to sign it because the person who creates the contract puts the money in there and locks it up. Mm -hmm. And it puts the parties who receive the money. So that right there, that's the guarantee right there. So I can look at it and I can see that my, you know, let's say my address is on there and I can see the payout date or whatever, all, anything that's in there. And I know that I'm going to get that money based on these criteria and I can start working. So you don't have, a, you don't have to actually sign anything. The, uh, mm -hmm. the party who initiates the contract does all that work. So like you, you kind of just answered it though, because you said the criteria was there. So like with the smart contracts, the recruiter would have to, the recruiter would have to meet well, find a, a, a crudy uh, that would fit these criteria. Like this person must at least have 
this amount of experience or yeah. have these type of skills or whatever. And once you submit that and say, you know, this is the person that I think fit, uh, fits y'all the best, then the smart contract is complete, correct? Yeah, yeah. So as soon as that person gets hired and I accept them, the contract gets, it also it also has a time limit too. So it makes people, you know, make sure they mm -hmm. do it, right? In a year, their money goes out anyway. So uh, you have a year to find, you know, so, uh, so when I accept a candidate, I can short circuit that and just send, you know, close the contract out and you'll get your money. Uh, okay, okay. I'm with you now. That's dope. So with Hire Match, y'all built it um, similar to, like you said, off of Ethereum, or did you have to go out and build your own coin for no, that? No, it's built on Ethereum. It's an ERC-20 token. So it's built on the Ethereum network. And it's dope. dope. The way that you just took advantage of the system, like yeah. for what they created it for, and you ended up doing it. And you, you said that, I think y'all got a y'all own coin with it, correct? Yeah, it's called Hire, H-R-I-R-E. Okay, so... They would transfer and put it into, so they'll take the 5,000 and they'll put it into the higher tokens. Is, is it a token? Yes, yeah, a higher token. token. That's dope. From there, the higher tokens. Uh, I guess just with cryptocurrencies outside of Bitcoin, it work the same way with like exchanging them for USD? Yeah, yeah, it works the same way. So you, uh, you can exchange it on an exchange. Hey man, that's some next level shit right there, man. How long did it take you to develop that? Like, did you, uh, you know, we're still developing it, man. We like IBM is like one of our uh, it just partnered with us. What three or four months ago, we're still developing. It takes a lot of work. <laughs> I could believe like it. two it's two years. Yeah, yeah, it's never been done before. Like I said, it's it's, it's hard. It's pretty hard, but we're we're gonna get it done here hopefully this year. So you say y'all been working on it for two years now? Yeah. The thing about it, what we we could have finished it faster, but there was a crypto winner. Mm -hmm. And all and all of our funds that we, we you know that we uh we developed was, was in crypto, so our funds went all the way down almost nothing for a year and a half. So we had to be careful how we spent it, you know. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't really you know go, go as fast as we could in two thousand what nineteen, uh, and most of twenty. So now we're at the point where we you know crypto's come back. So we do have the funds to uh to to push it hard. So not a and since we're on a uh, you know just the whole crypto conversation right now. I want to bring up something that recently happened in crypto. The Tesla, Tesla, Tesla doing the 1.5 bill. And I also saw that Miami, uh, they're trying to pay their uh pay pay their people in crypto. Like they're trying to get the uh yeah, county. The city? Yeah, like yeah. they're trying yeah. to get the city to start really adapting crypto. So yeah. now we're we're really starting to see like it being accepted. Yeah, by the institutions. Yeah, and uh, and that, that's that's one of the signs that it's going to be here to stay, stay. It's going to stay around, right? Is it no? But Tesla not going to put 1.8 billion into nothing that you're just trying to make a quick dollar. This is long term. Mm -hmm. So this is what uh, this is what you know what happens, and it should be a wake up call to everybody. The institutions are getting involved, and now it was a report that said Apple may buy some, and then another company, uh, J.P. Morgan, may get some. So this is going to stick around, man, and uh, and like you know. And just just those type of things just let you know that, that this is serious. I know when I seen uh, the J.P. Morgan one, I think that was I think J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, a couple other companies. That's whenever I first started like started looking at crypto more seriously because my mm -hmm. first introduction to it was the um, initial pump to twenty thousand when everybody yeah, was remember. talking about it, and then it's like, oh man, this just fell to nothing. Like, oh this this can't be something that's for me. But then I start seeing all these big players messing around in here. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Something they, going uh, on. These people are not they, just putting this money here for no reason. No, nah, they pushed it down on purpose. And I've been telling people on my Instagram for about a year, it was it was purpose. And I, I said that back in March. It was all on purpose. If you look back on it, you can see the pattern. That was that was intentional because what happened is that that they realized in 17 that crypto was gonna be a gonna be big the elite, the institutions and the banks. And if you look back and you look, cause you, some of the CEOs that said it was a fraud back then, now the same ones that, are bought, that bought it during that year. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, it, was a, it was a month period of time in January in which almost every, a lot, a lot of major CEOs came out against. It was a fraud, it's, it's nothing. It's a, and it was real, it was, a, it was a consorted effort to push it down on purpose from 20,000 all the way down to six. Uh, sometimes so even down to three in uh, the earlier last year. So if you notice during that time, all these big companies were buying it up slowly that you know why everybody was away from it like you said people you know gave up on it that's when they were getting into it right so that's called the market that's called the accumulation phase in uh, in markets is that they'll push you away from stuff on purpose so that they can get into it right because they because if you're putting like i said tesla if they put 1.8 billion in bitcoin they didn't do it in one day 
it was months because you can't put that much into a market without moving the price and you end up getting it at a, you'll spike the price up and get it too high and then it'll go back down. So what you do is you do it over time. You need months for that. So they buy it slowly over months not to affect the price. So they, they have to keep the price down during that time. It may take two years before everybody gets into it. And then once they feel like, you know, everybody's into it, that's when we hear about it. That's the markup phase in market. Yeah, that's when they start, they start actually promoting it to you and telling you about it. You know, if you notice on the cash app, uh, if you notice in your Cash App app, at the bottom, the icon even changed to a Bitcoin one in the last month or two. It did. It Cash did. App bought all this Bitcoin over the last year, and now they're actually marketing it. They want you to do it now because they want to they want to promote their own assets. That's crazy. And I'm thinking about like how Elon Musk did it over the past few months. Cause like he's been talking about he it. Put it in his bio. Put it in his Twitter. bio. Like he's been talking about I it. I would I would say he he probably bought it before he put it in his bio because it wouldn't make sense for him to promote it. He he bought it before that. Mm-hmm. And then he, when he already had the purchase complete, he put it in his bio. And then that's whenever he came out with the big announcement. Hey guys, yeah. I just put one point five bill. No, nah, he did that over months. He could before, probably man. had that shit in there for about two <laughs> years. Right? Yeah, yeah. He may have completed the whole buy. He didn't put one one point eight would have moved the market. You would have seen a visible spike on the chart. That much money in one. It had to be over months. Whenever that investment was announced, how much did it jump? Like it was, a, it jumped a lot though. I, yeah, I know like, it broke the all time high. The all time high was what forty two. No, that was that was fast, and that that was like a few weeks ago. Time's going by fast. <laughs> you know, a few a couple crazy. of months ago in December, it was like seventeen thousand. Mm-hmm. In the December, so it's only been about a month and a half. Yeah, <laughs> I, I definitely been seeing wow. a hella Coinbase commercials on uh YouTube yeah. and stuff. They say Morgan Stanley is thinking about putting one. That's who it was, Morgan Stanley. Yeah. They say they thinking about putting 150 billion in it, man. The institutions, man. They ain't gonna let themselves get outplayed. That's one thing about them people. Them. Yeah, that's why I like to encourage people. I'm like, man, is like a lot of people just see Bitcoin as an investment at the high level, right? But mm-hmm. if you really understand all everything under it, like the technology, the the purpose, the use case, all this stuff that's under there, you'll you'll really have a strong conviction. If you understand what it can be and what it what it maybe is gonna be in the future, you understand how it works, then you understand like you won't be so hesitant to put money into it because it's not just some kind of thing we just invest in or some kind of scheme. It's it's a lot deeper than that. Mm. It's almost it's, like so it's a life, it's it's a world changing technology, just like it just like the internet, if I, not I, greater. I even remember like last year, whenever there was talks of the stimulus at first. They were talking about a Fed coin. Mm-hmm. They were going to push yeah. the stimulus to like a, 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 a Fed coin. Dollar. They're going to do that, man, dollar. eventually. Do you think that'll kind of fuck up the market? Like, do you think they'll still have control of like, oh, this how many Fed coins we're pushing out? Or like, do you think that it'll really still stay de- decentralized? No, nah, I mean, uh, with the Fed, if they make a Fed coin, they're going to have all kind of backdoors in it. They, they want a Fed coin that you get taxed, when it, like they could tax it as you transfer. That's what they oh, want. Man. You know, so you can't, with a fair coin, you can't get away with taxes. That's it. You're going to be taxed. Everybody will be taxed at the right rate from that point on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so can't, you get- you'll be taxed before you get the money. Like if I send it, like I said, like I say, I send you some money for something, you know, and it falls in a certain category, it's going to tax me before you even get it. So that's mm-hmm. what, that's why they want that fair coin for, because they can tax people uh, really easy and track spending, which they almost can do now. I ain't fucking with that. Yeah, but they and it's, and it's cheaper for them, right? Because uh, Bitcoin has a set supply, so they can't create any more. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, uh, they, they can't create more, but there's a set number that they can't create any more. But I bet you the Fed coin, I bet you they won't do that because they nah. always want the ability to create more. So uh, that means they it's cheaper because they don't have to print dollars. They don't have to do anything. Just press a button. And it, it even makes sense, like with them last year. I remember there was the the coin shortage that was going on last year. Like oh, there's a national coin shortage. Like I ain't never heard of no yeah. national coin shortage they, until the damn pandemic. They man. printed too much money, bro. They was they had <laughs> there was no coins to go with because they couldn't print the coins fast enough. That's what happened. Because coins it? take a while to print. They could they, they all that money they put out there was electric. So now people mm-hmm. want to change for that electric money and they don't have it. <laughs> yeah, it's just a digital ledger. That's why I like whenever they start talking about the digit dollar and stuff, it made sense because uh, like the statistic was, I think 20% of the money in existence was printed like in the third quarter of last year, like yeah, since the inception of America. So it's like, that's, that's a huge jump. They, and I mean, what they talking about printing next? Like what's the next stimulus? Like one point. Yeah, it's, it's big, man. 
That's scary, man, because all we got to pay for that one day with inflation or something. Let, let, let's talk about that because that's something that is very real. And uh, the Fed, my boy Powell, he, 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 Jerome, he not stopping yeah, Jerome ain't, ain't, ain't quitting. He already said it, man. Look, we until all of these people that that's hurting, we ain't gonna stop printing this dollar. But a lot of people, like you said, inflation is going to be some type of re- repercussion for us printing so much money. We are like the world, the uh, reserve currency, but still, it comes to a point where the rubber meets the road where, okay, now you got too much of this money and it becomes useless. Yeah, and it's like, it's going to be a single point which that happens, man. Everybody at once will realize this too. All this money, man, like you, I kind of already see it. A lot of people, if you notice... A lot of people do have a lot of money right now <laughs> with stocks and whatever. You notice that like everybody's winning in everything. It's like mm. it's now, now is that a sign that the, the people have too much money? I don't know, but it does seem like there's a lot of money out in the economy. It just seems that way. <clears throat> you know, everybody has money now and like it's few people that are struggling, but uh, it, it seems like that to me, man. But like I said, it could be just my perception of it. I'd be the TL, man. You know, you see a lot of people winning on the TL in the stock market for sure. Yeah since the beginning of the pandemic because the proliferation of like, uh, I guess investing, like even conversations like we have right now, the platforms out there that are like encouraging people to invest. So many people got into the markets at the bottom and now they seeing them wins and them gains. They may have put like 15, 20 bands in back then and now they up, up. Like they, to the markets up over, how, how much since the the end of the uh, pandemic? Like I know it's a lot of the lowest it got was like 16, 17,000 the Dow. Now it's at like 30, I think right around 30. Mm-hmm. It doubled, now, basically doubled. Now I think the S&P was about to touch a, a record high like this past week too. I don't know if it was like 40. You said Jim Cramer said the markets need a buy. Yeah, a Jim Cramer said, man, we need a week off, man. What's what's next for you, Armando? Like you got you got uh, your higher match. And you you teach people about the long term investing and things like that. What else do you have that you're working on, my brother? No, like what I'm doing now, and I've been t- telling people about it on my Instagram, or whatever. Is I'm getting into real estate. Like I don't, I don't, I don't know much about it now, but I am uh, trying to get into real estate now. So you know, because I think that with the, with the millennials uh, coming, you know, a lot of, and, and also the generation, I think the next generation after that. Uh, if you look around in every city, they're building apartments everywhere, mm-hmm. all over the place. That tells you that there's a demand for housing now. And, and it's because of all these people graduating and coming into the cities. So um, so I can kind of see that coming is that there's going to be a uh, housing is probably even if the economy crashes, uh, everything's going to crash. If that happens, housing, I think, won't take as big of a hit. Uh, and it'd be a, so I see housing being a long term uh just owning something, a piece of something mm-hmm. somewhere, man. I think that's going to be a long-term goal in the next few years because you can see that there, that there's, there's, there's a demand for it, man. Every city I've been to in the last two years got like five or six housing com- you know, complex going up in the downtown area. You know, Nashville, uh, Tampa, uh, St. Pete, uh, Atlanta, everywhere you go, man. And that shows Dallas, you that Dallas, you know, Dallas especially. Apartments yeah, apartments coming. You know, they're like, the, you know, those apartments, a lot of those apartments too are where they have like it all in one where, you got like commercial at the bottom and you got the apartments on top. That's getting popular too. And I could just see that, uh, you know, it, it coming to a head here in the next five to 10 years and the ability to make a lot of money in that, especially in areas like like Dallas or like like here in Pinellas County in Clearwater, Florida, anywhere in Florida, anywhere in, in Texas, really, because mm-hmm. a tech, I read a report too that said Texas, Florida, and California are going to be have a, uh, a, a lot of movement in real estate because people all over the country are moving to these places because they have now have the ability to work at home and a lot of companies not going back to that. So you always get, everybody can work at home. They're going to pick a, a warmer place to live, you know? So I think that's going to help the uh, real estate in Texas, California, and Florida. So that's what I'm in Puerto Rican real estate. I'm also investing some into that uh, because of certain things over there, tax advantages and the, the markets depressed over there. So that's what I'm doing over the next three or four years, uh, focusing on that and, uh, and trying to get higher match completed over the next year. So with your real estate, is that what type of criteria you're looking for? Are you going to be looking for like the apartment type? Are you trying to get in a re- uh, residential? Right. I mean, at first, this, I'm very early in that. I'm just trying to get into residential stuff now and just get my head around it. Right. So mm-hmm. I, I'm getting I just <clears throat> I'm closing on a property here in, uh, in Clearwater this month and I'm hopefully closing on another one in Puerto Rico. 
So right now I'm just trying to get my head around it, right? If, you know, if I lose money, whatever, as long as I understand what I'm doing, I don't want to step out too big, but my intention is eventually start either getting into development. Uh, Cause I have a friend that, uh, I have a friend that has a friend who actually does that. Uh, my business partner actually. And I want to get into, uh, you know, uh, you know, more commercial real estate eventually, but that's, you know, you got to learn it first. You got to mm-hmm. take baby steps. And that's I, an important lesson in that, man. You, I, anybody. Yeah. yeah and right. I like how you highlighted it too. You said, you know, I'm not afraid to lose money as long as I learn from this process. Exactly. And I think that's something that you highlighted it earlier. Also, whenever you first got into your stock journey, you was like, you know, I, I got up. It took four or but, five years. But, you know, over that year, I still, I, I lost it. Like I made the 20 bands, but I lost it. But what I learned from losing it, I was able to continue building upon it. So I like that you you have that mindset of, you know, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and I'm going to learn from trial and error. Yeah, like I say, even if you lose money on that deal, you, you the, the education you got for it was worth the money. And a lot of people don't get that concept, right? They don't want to, you, you not. it's hard to start anything and not lose money. I mean, you're going to make a mistake. You're going to lose money in business, investing or whatever. But you just have, you, you almost have to go into that with that mindset. Well, if, it, it's, you know, if I lose money, I learn something, right? But if I, and, and every time I've lost money with any kind of endeavor in the, in the past, I end up making a lot more in the future. Right. So initially you, you almost going to lose money, man. You start a business, you're going to do some stuff wrong. You start investing, you may do some stuff wrong. You have to understand that a lot of people, I think, have a hard time wrapping their heads around that concept. They don't want to pay that rookie tax. They're learning. Uh, and it, that could be expensive, man. Like it could be a thousands, hmm. but you know, it's worth it. School of hard knocks. They need that. <laughs> they need that tuition. Exactly. So I, I kind of want to talk about Puerto Rico too. You know, you said it's, it's a depressed market and stuff. That kind of sounds like, you know, What's going on down there? Like, tell me, tell me the reason. No, I mean, it's it's uh, uh, th- this year and last year. There's been earthquakes in the south part of the island. Then you got on top, and then you what a year and a half or two years ago, there was a hurricane that wiped mm-hmm. it was, Then before that, it was another hurricane. Then you got the economy on, on top of all of that. So now the, the real estate price in Puerto Rico about fifty percent lower than what they were at the you know uh, ten years ago because of people the mass uh, amount of people leaving the island because of all these troubles. Uh, you know, and just, and then they also have a, a, what's called the Act 22 down there, where you can be exempt from taxes completely just living down there. Oh, really? You're exempt from U.S. taxes completely. Yo, Act, it's called the Act 22 because Puerto Rico falls into a loophole of, uh, of taxation from the United States because uh, Puerto Rico is a colony, is, is basically a colony kind of commonwealth or whatever. Mm-hmm. But Ter- the Constitution Ter- says it's a territory, but uh, the, uh, the, the government, uh, the Constitution says you can't tax without representation. Uh, Puerto Rico doesn't have senators. They don't have mm-hmm. representatives. So they, the U.S. can't tax them. But they can, so they, they passed a law called the Act 22 where you go down there, you fill out some paperwork, costs you about $10,000 to do all the work. You only pay 4% tax on, on, on uh, corporations from then on out or any capital gains, mm-hmm. right? So, that, and that's, that's, your, that, that's it. You're, you're exempt from U.S. taxes. You just pay them 4%. Completely. <laughs> Damn. That's a whole gym. <laughs> but, yeah, but you have to, uh, you have to go there. It takes some work and you have to move out. You have to be there at least six months out of the year. You have to live down there. And it's the I mean, only only place on earth you can do that. I wouldn't mind living there like six months where hurricanes not coming through. Yeah, six months a year, man. And, and like some people say, you could save enough to probably, in a couple of years, probably buy a house down there, a condo or whatever. But uh but I'm looking into that now, but uh, in the real estate there, like I said, it's very, very cheap now. So I'm buying some down there. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm looking into Puerto Rico for. What's, what's some of the prices uh, down there? Like, what, what could you get? Like It depends. I mean, if you're in the city, it's, it's you, they're going to be cheap, but not that cheap. But if you go outside of the cities, I mean, and there's some places where you can get fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. You could be like maybe four blocks from the beach in the south part of Island or the east part. Um, so, yeah, the west part. Sorry. Way better than in Florida or somewhere like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I want to kind of note, like, the play with that. Could you do it as a vacation rental where people might Airbnb yeah. it out and yeah, stuff like that? that? That's, that's my plan is to uh, Airbnb it out. Okay, because I, I know some places, like, they got restrictions on it and stuff like yeah. that. It's not that bad down there. It's probably it's probably the same as anywhere else you would go. Yeah, I mean, a lot of cities got restrictions. People just don't listen to them. Because <laughs> a lot of cities say 30-day rentals is the minimal, and people still rent their places for, you know, Airbnb. That's a true. lot of cities have that law. Uh, probably Dallas has it. Yeah. I know uh, New Orleans. Yeah, New Orleans. They ain't like, they're, they're, they're like the hotel industry was dying after Airbnb yeah. hit, and they was like, "Oh no, that's crazy." So let's let's pivot on to the last section, my brother. Line. Let's get into what's on your timeline. 
anything that you might have saw that was funny. It could be something serious. Uh, pretty much anything that you felt like you saw it on the Instagram. Well, not even just Instagram. You Internet, saw it anywhere. Yeah, and you want to speak on it. I don't know. Like I see a lot of people talking about LLCs a lot on the, on the timeline and how a lot LLCs, of that. which is which is positive in a way. But what it does, I think, is it gives people a false impression of what an LLC really is. Talk about you know? it. so, like that. Like I've like one of the funniest things I see is like people will say, uh, and it's it's mostly clout chasing. You know, people just trying to get clout. But uh, like a lot of people do present it the right way and tell you to get LLC. LLC is a lot of you know it's good to have one. It protects you against liability, protects you against taxes. A lot of good good reasons for LLC. But the thing I see on my timeline a lot is people just say, hey, uh, take your tax return and, 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 and buy LLC. Thank me later. Like, what, what is that going to do for you? <laughs> buy LLC, create generational wealth. Yeah, like that, just, just like directly that. to it. Like, you, it's a lot of steps between those two, right? <laughs> it's a lot of steps between those two, man. The LLC just paperwork. Or the one I see is like, uh, get an LLC and then get an SBA loan. Like they're not gonna give you a loan, man, because you filled out paperwork. It's not. Gonna, I mean, everybody. I would do that. I would just fill out a hundred grade, you know, a hundred LLCs to get loans on each one of them. If we could do that, Hell and yeah. then, then just close the LLCs down. They couldn't do nothing. Our bankruptcy. Yeah, <laughs> on all the companies, right? <laughs> I, 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 what I would do is I create one company that's a marketing company, and ten other companies get their loans on it, pay the marketing company for marketing fees, and do legitimate work to close the other ones down. I mean, obviously. You can't do that, you know. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's what I'm saying is that any everybody would be doing that. So you have they they're not going to give you a loan unless you show some kind of collateral or show some mm -hmm. potential or money coming in. They're not going to do that. But it's a lot of people that post that stuff mm -hmm. and and, uh, and and get people confused. And they're like, what? Uh, you know, they 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 think that they could just do an LLC and get all these benefits. There is is a big benefit to having an LLC, but I think it's oversold sometimes. Definitely. I, I 100% agree with you, Armando. Hell yeah, like, man. <laughs> that's something we, we see too much on the internet, uh, just like that whole conversation. It's, it's important, once again, like you're saying, but we need to understand that if you're going to have an LLC, actually have a business. Don't exactly. just think that this paper is going to solve all your problems. They skip that part. They're like, hey, get an LLC, pay your kids. Well, what money? <laughs> I mean, you got, it's, it's no, it's no benefit year. unless you got money coming in. <laughs> like, what you gonna pay your kids with? I mean, they skip that part, you know. I guess that's the hard part they don't want to talk about. But that's that's yeah, part a little of bit less marketable. Culture. What you said, dude? Say so, yeah, that's a little bit less marketable. <laughs> <laughs> Internet culture, man. Everybody want it fast. And Everybody's easy. scared of that real work, man. Fast that's what it easy, is, bro. man. Fast yeah, and easy. It Make is. it sound fast and easy, so they'll be like, "Oh, look, yeah. I share this with my friend." You know, hey, we go each get a LL. We go get our LLC. We go get fifty bands of business credit today. Nothing yeah, that's what they think. They go walk and say that. I bet they walk to the bank with confidence, and they realize quickly. The bank's like, "What? <laughs> we ain't got no statements or nothing." I mean, <laughs> Who told you uh, that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the what thing about mean? it is that it makes sense. If you just think about it, it, it makes sense. Like, like I always tell people, I said, "Would you do it if you was the bank?" And I went and fill out the paperwork again. Would you give me a loan? Most people would say no. No, nah, I wouldn't. Okay, what you think the bank's gonna do? I mean, I'm like, just because you got it, you, you signed the paper that said this is your new company and you, I'm, nobody, that, that doesn't even make sense, man. But they got people out here believing that that's, that's how it works. Got to stay safe in these internet streets, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Folks will have you at your loss, confused, and misguided. Yeah, but, be in jail, man, with some of that tax stuff they talk about. Hell yeah. Right. But yeah, Armando, man, we appreciate you coming right. on the podcast today, chopping it up with us, man. It's been a, a great episode, great convo. But uh, all our followers, all our listeners, man, could you please plug yourself in? Let them know where they can follow you, how they can get in tune with your services, where they can learn more about Higher Match, all that, my brother. Yeah, Higher Match is at HigherMatch.io. That's the website, H-I-R-E-M-A-T-C-H.io. Uh, uh, you can follow me on Instagram or uh, on uh, also YouTube, uh, Tall Guy Tycoon, T-A-L-L-Y. Uh, I'm sorry, T-A-L-L-G-U-Y-T-Y-C-O-O-N. -L -L Tall Guy Tycoon, or you can just look up my name, Armando Pantoja. That's a bet. Y'all definitely, definitely tap in. Like my brother David said, man, appreciate you for coming on the no, show. I appreciate dude. you guys, man. No problem, man. We definitely enjoyed this conversation. Um, for everyone, if you are new here, we definitely hope that you appreciated this episode. Uh, let us know what you thought about it, what you liked about it, what you didn't like about it. Um, it just helps us give you the best value that we can. Um, appreciate you to everyone who comes in week in, week out, and really just 
continues to be a part of our family. We just ask that you keep on bringing in some new family members so we can keep on growing. Y'all know our goal for this year. We're trying to get to 20,000 weekly listeners on the new episodes this year. So y'all help us reach that goal. Yeah, Smash that share button. Tell everybody about it because um, we're really just trying to give some good value and get, do some work around here. I appreciate you guys. No problem, appreciate my you. brother. Anybody else got something? Uh, Nah, man, brother Spiller, you got you got any uh, reviews? Anything you want to share from the people? Yeah, let me share this one good review, man. We got one uh, from Best Damn Taylor. Man, you've outdone yourself. This is the most insightful podcast that I've listened to. It's a great way to reposition our minds towards deeper entrepreneurial moves. This is the first episode I've listened to from you all, not the last. Shout Amen. out to you. Yes, indeed. We let it hear. We let it see it. Yes, 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 so, yes, y'all. Tap in with us, lead and rate, lead and reviews. Like my brother Jalen said, share with your family. Um, and on that note, Black Wolf Renaissance, signing out. Peace. Peace. I got money on my mind. Yeah. I'm just trying to get some dough. I ain't picking up my line unless it's money on the phone.